Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Builder Spotlight series. In this series, we are shining a light on the incredible builders who are doing awesome things with no code. So today we have a special episode lined up for you. We'll be talking to two remarkable builders, Toby and Rajiv. They are the creative minds behind TripMix, which is a social trip sharing application for travelers and creators. This application is powered by Xeno, Bravo, and gener Generative AI. Um, so today we'll be diving into their journey. Super excited. I want to hear all about how you came up with this idea. And then you did launch beta back in October. So really excited to hear about your journey, how you went from um, having that idea all the way to the launch of beta. So yeah, really excited to hear about the innovation, the determination, all the challenges that you faced as well as to hear about what is next for you. Let's get started with some introductions. Uh, Toby, would you mind just sharing a little bit about yourself, about your gut background and what got you interested in no-code development? Sure. So, um, well, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, so my, my name is Toby. I'm the CEO of, of, of Bravo Studio. Uh, Bravo Studio is a, is a no-code tool for helping people build mobile applications. And you know, we've been working with Zano. A lot of our customers use Zano and work with Zano. It's a really good partner for Bravo. Uh, you know, doing all the backend stuff, whereas Bravo really focuses on the native mobile front-end side. And you know, we've been doing that for about four years. Um, and I, I'll, but I'll hand over to Rajiv to talk about how we met and how all that went on uh, from his side. So, you know, it's pretty interesting. So the, the idea really got sort of triggered right after I had finished traveling to Japan, uh, I would say, Jan 2020. So uh, put in a lot of effort into planning the trip. I enjoyed it. I figured there might be something I can sort of, you know, leverage from that experience. And then the pandemic happened. So we had really no place to go. Um, you know, I took up on travel blogging, interestingly, because I, I figured maybe that's a good way to sort of inspire other travelers and just share my stories. And since the painful spot is all putting a trip together, I figured I'll focus my sort of the the travel blog for creating sort of more visual trips uh, with a lot of detail. And, um, you know, it's during that time I sort of talked to a couple of friends, did some research, and two interesting things came out. I think most people are get influenced by recommendations from people they follow or their friends and want to sort of mimic their trip. They read blogs, Instagram posts, et cetera. But it's very hard to sort of recreate that. It's, you know, putting something, making it actionable was the hard part. And then since I was blogging, I was like, oh, maybe there's this creator side. How do these guys make money, if at all, right? And I, I just found that some of the biggest problems for them was attribution. They just had a very hard time monetizing all the recommendations and knowledge that they share. So I figured maybe there is a way to sort of connect these two in some sort of a platform or an app. I, I wanted to build a mobile app. So to me, going on a desktop app was not an option. So that was the moment. It was like, you know, we pick up a couple of stories. I'm a big user of Strava. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. It's a fitness app. Uh, I ride bikes. So one of the couple of things that I got inspired was the idea of discovering other members' trip routes, right? Cycling routes, et cetera and how there was a social element to interact with other members in the community and, and to plan your own route. So it had all the three elements I was looking for in an app. And uh, we, you know, we put some designs in Figma, uh, did some iterations. Our focus was very design heavy, which was like get the interaction right first. And then, um, you know, once we, I felt pretty comfortable uh, with those couple of user stories, I wanted to build something, like I said, you know, with low engineering efforts, low costs, and something that I've already invested in, in Figma. So just did some research, stumbled upon Toby and Bravo. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think we just started sort of doing some pro proof of concept, connected with Xano, and started to build the app a little bit. So, I know, Toby, you want to highlight how we sort of, what you saw and what inspired you as well? Sure. I mean, I think that the idea of kind of taking a Figma design and then working with Bravo is, is a perfect fit for us. I mean, that's really what Bravo wins, particularly in the early stages where 
you know, people have got how they want it to look and they want to make that real. You know, Bravo is probably one of the best ways of doing that. And I think we saw this saw as, as, a, as a really nice application of Bravo, so which is why we've been trying to promote it and, and push it, you know, from our side. Uh, but also, I think, I think we introduced you to Xano as well, right? I think yeah, you did. you did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we probably have got the commission for that. Yeah, we probably need to sort that out at some point. But, <laughs> uh, but, but the thing is, you know, I think what we find is that often people come to us with ideas and then we steer them and say, look, you know, with this kind of project, and nine times out of 10, Xano is a great fit. You know, Xano is a great flexible tool. It helps people kind of take their ideas. It doesn't require too much technical knowledge. You can still build it. So it's a great fit for people who want to build things, particularly in the early stages where you want to change things quickly. Um, you know, both that combination of Bravo and Xano really works really well. And, you know, what I saw with, with, with the TripMix was, you know, it was a really different approach to the heading travel. It fitted really well with this sort of mobile and the sort of, the, the, these, the, these tools like uh, uh, Bravo and Xano help to kind of bring this idea to life. You know, going, I think probably Rajiv would, would say, you know, you, you go to a, a mobile agency nowadays asking for buildings like TripMix, it would cost you, God knows how, but tens of thousands of dollars to build. Um, you know, and we're able to not only build it, but also be able to, and I think this is a really important part for both Sano and, and, and Bravo's perspective. It, it's easy to tweak things, you know, you can build it, but then you can change things easily. So, you know, often when you're testing with users, you want to be able to kind of take the idea to them and say, okay, does this work? And they go, I like this. I don't like this. And it, you can iterate much faster than having an agency and waiting for a month while they turn it around and make the changes. And then it's never quite what you wanted. You know, we have all those issues, but if you, yeah, giving the control back to the sort of the owner of the idea means that they can, they can play with things much faster. Uh, so I think it's, it's been a great partnership. I think, I think we, we've learned a lot. I think Rajiv has really pushed the platform, uh, it, it improved, helped improve it. Uh, and we've got to a product that I think is going to be pretty cool. I love that you highlighted all of that. And I think one thing to know, or something that really stuck out to me particularly is you mentioned a couple of times that you want to be able to like iterate over something, right? You want to be able to change something quickly. And it might not be something that maybe people take into consideration when they're starting to build an application, right? Like how much that happens, um, how many times you have to change something or you have to pivot to something different. So I would love to to learn a little bit more about, you know, how the idea of trip mix evolved from when you first thought about it to what it is today, and maybe some of those pivotal moments of that evolution, um, if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. I mean, listen, I think from the core, the concept has always been about community-generated travel itinerary wrecks and in a place where, you know, even a traveler like myself can become a creator. And I think we have become very sort of heavy recommendation creator centric app today from where we started with, but the core hasn't changed. Uh, I think what's been very pivotal, at least from my point of view, has been in the last several months. The hard part of traveling and trip planning is the planning. You know, you enjoy it, but it can be pretty onerous. And doing it on a mobile device, which is very critical for, was even more challenging. So I think a few months ago when uh, when we were sort of building out some of our core features and testing out with the users, ChatGPT came along. Okay, so I think it was very revolutionary. I mean, it was impeccable. And um, we felt that it's going to solve that problem that we were looking for is a creation piece where um, you can create it fast. You can also get a recommendation, use it as a framework. And I think what was beautiful about where we were in our journey was we had already built the building blocks. We had the ability with Xana to connect to Google to get places, get enriched data. We already had the structure of what an itinerary looks like visually. Uh, we had some nice editing features that Bravo was able to build, like, you know, swipe to delete and reorder, et cetera. I think Toby was very instrumental in connecting, help us connect to open AI's chat GPT using Xana, which was, I think, just a beautiful example of how quickly we could actually build something and iterating. It's just a start. Okay. I mean, we haven't solved everything, but where it is today, and you'll see it, you know, when you when you take a look at how you can put a simple text input into the app and within minutes it can generate 
a, a complete truck and a recommendation that you can actually customize to your needs. It's mind blowing. There were two main things for me that stick out. Um, one is, was uh, through the development of this, we added the connection to Google Maps and Google the, the, the plate, Google information. Uh, that was something, and what was great, again, I'm, I'm going to highlight some of this on the technical side, but it was really good to see from a Xano perspective that we were able to have multiple people collaborating on a project. So, you know, we were Rajiv brought in as people to help work on particular features and they were able to dive in. And what was great is they could focus on a few of the endpoints. So they could just say, right, you, I'm going to focus on this, use the data model to build the endpoints up that we could use and reuse in the other parts of the project without really causing huge distraction across the rest of the project. So we could kind of work in our own areas. And that was really great. And I think that that sort of bringing on the Google data then enabled, and then so when ChatGPT came along a bit further on, we, as community said, we had a lot of the building blocks in place and it was pretty easy to hook into ChatGPT and bring that data into, into Xano and then present that in Bravo and bring it all together. So I think this idea of kind of separating things out by endpoints, which kind of naturally falls out with Xano, worked really well in our favor of working with different people. Uh, you know, and I think, you know, as I say, the chat GPT was a bit of a game changer. I mean, the trouble is it's one of those things that keeps changing every five minutes. You think you've got the hang of it as they introduce 10 new features. So it's not something that stays around very long, but it's incredibly powerful. And it, and it just, I think, Rajiv has been very fortunate. I don't know, well, very uh uh opportunistic it, it really came along with us at the right time i mean we have looking yeah. at this issue Asian, i mean i, chat, I chat, chat, chat. definitely yeah i mean i sorry to jump in i mean i think it was a very exciting moment because we were first thinking friend of foe because it could actually you know you have to really see what's the value i see it as a co-creator i think if you're a traveler it's it's a great place for you to sort of get a plan and a recommendation if you're a creator Travel blogger who wants to monetize. It's great for them too because it's a really great starting point for for something you can you take months to put together. You can do it in minutes, and then sort of add your own expertise and research your pictures. So visually very powerful. I think design was key for us and the whole iteration process. You know, fix something here or let's try this out. I think these platforms have helped do us. I mean, I I, I can't imagine you know having a massive technical debt with a lot of engineers and trying to sort of build this out, I think. So it's a beautiful no-code stack. I mean, Xano back in, Bravo front end, and open AI. I, I think it's just incredible. Yeah, I, one thing I just add on to that. I think um, I think that the, the fact that both Xano and Bravo focus on sort of the API way of connecting things plays really well into the whole chat GPT thing. Most yeah. of these AI tools coming out are very API focused. So, you know, by using these tools and often, you know, you want ChatGPT to do something, then you need to kind of process it a bit. So you kind of need something like Xano to help you do that. And then you need to present it. And so that's where Bravo is really good. So it kind of helps to kind of connect all the things together and, and then iterate and, and, you know, be handle all these fast changes that are going on without having to do massive rebuilds all the time, because you can just make small tweaks and kind of get it all going together. Absolutely. No, this, this sounds so exciting. I feel like everything that you're kind of saying, uh, makes me really curious about, you know, some of the features that, that you're offering your users. And I know you mentioned a couple, right? You said that you typed a prompt in, it can generate a trip for you. You can edit that trip. But I really want to hear from you. Um, what are the two features that you're, you're most excited about that you want people to see um, that, that, that you love? Yeah, I think I've already mentioned some, but, you know, if you take a look, I mean, going into the app first. I'm just going to just say, so I think the whole idea of building a travel app like this on a no code platform in itself is very unique. Um, I don't think there are many apps out there, perhaps there. But if you, if you want to isolate features, clearly our ability to sort of integrate with chat GPT to take, you can enter like a simple text like here, um, destination, duration just some interests and preferences. It's just all pure text. And our ability to then take this and generate this in two minutes or less, a, a complete 10-day trip, for example, with maps, photos, descriptions. Um, as you can see here, it's it's incredible. I, I think that is just a very, very powerful and just a start. Um, the second feature I would say is, is once you take this trip, as this example, you can 
you know, edit. Uh, the editing features in mobile is hard, right? It's very easy to do it on desktop, but on, on mobile, you have to sort of focus more on gestures. So, you know, swipes, scroll ups, um, long press, pinch, all those things are very important. So I think we've been able to accomplish that. To me, that was very powerful. And then, you know, because this is sort of like a community generated uh, data recommendation app, you can use, for example, you can combine experiences from different app, uh, different travelers into one trip. And I think that whole sort of editing, remixing capability, I felt is very, very powerful. I have another question for you. So I know we've, we've talked a lot about, you know, um, like different challenges that kind of came through, the iterations, how this application has changed. And I really want to just kind of highlight here, take a moment for those people that haven't gone through the process of maybe um, building an application yet. Um, I'm curious to hear, what do you think was the the biggest obstacle that you you faced as you were kind of navigating through this? Um, and maybe like if you could share like what's like a one big lesson that you learned, like your the lesson that kind of stands out the most uh, from kind of going through the process of coming up with this idea and then launching beta. I think probably for me, there's a, there's a great line in development, which is um, premature optimization is the root of all evil. Uh, because often when you're building things, te technical things, you tend to kind of think about all the different use cases and you, you kind of build it, you start to get in this rabbit hole of building something that is super flexible and does everything. And actually you don't need to do that. And I think we did some of that. I think we built a data model in Xano to try to think about all the different things we wanted to do. But what that actually caused was, you know, it, it made things a bit harder later on. And some of the things we might, which we didn't actually use that much, we might go back to. So I think one of the things I would say is try and keep things as generic as possible until you know exactly what you're going to do, or you have a better idea of what you're going to do, so that you know, you're not having to try and optimize for something that never, never occurs. Um, that was probably one of the big things, how we set things up. We had some issues with Xano a little bit. Um, and partly that was probably me not trying to do, trying to push it too hard in certain areas. We had a, we had, we had a problem with, with the lambdas where the endpoints would just fail for no reason. It was really hard to know, but the great thing was the support was really good. Chris kind of came to our rescue a few times and gave us some pointers as to what the use, what might be going on. So we managed to fix that. And, uh, you know, I think it's generally been pretty great experience trying to get things, you know, having issues and getting them fixed. The documentation is really good on the Zeno side. I mean, there were some challenges also from the Bravo side, I would say, trying to get all of Rajiv's crazy ideas to make them appear in the, in the, in, in Bravo, which, you know, made it, made it challenging, but you know, I think we've, what was great is again, what's interesting from a Bravo perspective is you can, can solve people things from a design perspective. You know, what's great with Xano is you can solve things with a sort of technical or sort of coding perspective, but or a logic perspective. But in Bravo, you can do things in lots of different design ways. That means you can get to a good solution without necessarily uh, compromising what the idea, original idea was. So I think, you know, it's been a lot of learnings, but the, the main takeaway I would say is don't try and plan everything to the nth degree at the beginning, leave it, you know, sort of open until you really know how things are going to look, because that will probably save you time in the long run. Uh, Rajiv, do you have anything to add? Yeah, to I, I mean, from my perspective, I mean, as Toby said, I had a lot of crazy ideas. Um, and listen, I mean, it was my first foray into building mobile apps. I think no, so there, there's a couple of things I wanted. There's a lot of capabilities you have, so it's pretty endless. I think what Bravo and Xero was helping is to do those checks where you could you have to come up with some alternatives, some restrictions. And I think that sort of design iteration build process was very helpful for me um, because it kept me in check a little bit. And it's like, okay, you know, just don't go that fast. But I also have to comment on that, that there were certain things that I was very passionate about in terms of user experience, which I think from a Bravo perspective, Toby and team, looking at our timeline, we're able to accommodate some features that we wanted to build, which are sort of, I would say, very essential for the user experience. So I think that that was very helpful. And same thing with Xano. I think, you know, I used to ping Chris and Michael on, on Xano support all the time. It was like, hey, how about this? And what can I do this? And, um, and they would be very patient about sort of coming back with the, hey, wait for the next version or a new update's coming in. But I have to say both support have been very, very helpful. I think for a semi-technical founder like myself, 
I, I think these two tools have been really instrumental because even I can go in and I can look at the data, I can sort of understand the logic behind things. So, you know, I just wanted to sort of say that out. I think there have been challenges, but this is how we also come with them. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think all of this is going to be so valuable for anybody that's listening that, you know, wants to launch their application or kind of started in this journey and hasn't done it yet. So really appreciate both of you um, sharing, sharing any advice, anything that, that you think that people should look out for as it can become like re really helpful down the road. Is there anything else that you would like to add before we wrap up today's session? I would sort of try and summarize this set of as tips to people entrepreneurs or designers who are looking at these tools to build apps. I think, number one, I think it's a very important skill set for a product designer to have. I think just knowing how to design from a UX perspective in Figma is not sufficient. I think building up skill set in Bravo um, really helps you to sort of take your design and prototype simultaneously. It, I wish I had been able to do that when I, we had started a very first journey with design. So, it, it, you know, I think that's a very important skill set. In fact, our product owner, Juan, is a Bravo expert, designs the app, but has over the last year has picked up Xano so well that he can do a lot of things, not necessarily relying on Toby and others in the team to sort of um, do it. So, you know, it's a really, really good skill set to have. And more recently, I think one of our software engineers, she's got a Java Python background. Like in less than a month, she picked on Xano uh, and started building a lot of the endpoints. So very, 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 very helpful tool. Um, the second point I would say is I had thought about just building an MVP with this platform, but where I am today, this is going to the app store. Uh, we are definitely going to make this into a production app. So I think that's the level of confidence I have. Yeah. One thing I just want to reiterate, actually, just on, on what Rajiv said, I think it was really interesting for me that the product, the Juana product, product owner was able to learn what well, he already knew as Bravo to start with, but he was able to learn Xano. And I think what's, what's really powerful about that is it just speeds up the iteration. You know, he's making the changes to the design, but he can tweak the back end as well now. So he can kind of go, oh, this is what's wrong. I'll fix it. And it's done. And that just, it's just like a, it's like a 10X is the speed of getting things done. You don't have to wait to somebody turn around and figure out what needs to happen. That he can make the changes himself. And I yeah. think that's where, you know, you can just get that much closer to what the user, the user needs and the value creation, because you're constantly making these changes without having to wait for these extra latencies that come in. So I think it's a really powerful point. And it just shows you how, what these tools can really bring uh, to the whole conversation. So last but not least, I do want to, you know, share a little bit about how people can get access to treatment. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't mind just kind of sharing a little bit about, you know, how people can check out the application, any steps that they need to take. Um, and of course, when and where they can provide feedback for both of you. Yeah, no. Up to, um, so we are currently in private beta um, this month. So it's mostly by sign up on our uh, landing page on our website. At, uh get tripmix.app and uh, you'll get notified by email. Then we provide you access and then you can download the app and pass. There's an in-app feedback form that you can send feedback. There is also a Slack community you can join. Uh, the information is on the email that you receive. Uh, so we plan to sort of stay in private beta for a couple of more weeks, maybe into the new year. And then uh, we have some more exciting updates coming in. Very much looking forward to those. Um, super excited to to get on the app. Keep trying it out. Again, we encourage all of our viewers to go check it out. Let us know what you think. Fill out the feedback form. Um, and yeah, we'll love having you here and look forward to to catching up again soon, Rajiv and Toby. Yeah, sounds, sounds good. good. All right. Okay. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks.